Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Uh, just one bit of housekeeping before we turn in the book of Joshua that I wanted to let you know from several weeks ago that our elders have agreed to host East Cobb Church here from January to June, beginning January the 12th at 4.30 in the afternoon, and we look forward to seeing another gospel church planted in our community. If you'll take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Joshua 6 and 7 and 8, and get in that neighborhood, we'll stay there for a while and look in God's Word as we continue this series about Joshua, God's general. We'll be looking at Joshua 6, Joshua 7, and parts of Joshua chapter 8. We'll dip a little bit too into Romans in just a matter of minutes. Well, let's begin. One day, a 37-year-old small-time crook robbed the wrong elderly lady. On July 21, 1996, he snatched the wallet of a 94-year-old woman named Yolanda Gigante in New York City. And when the New York Police Department picked him up, the arresting officer said, you just robbed the mother of the biggest mobster in the city of New York. Mrs. Yagante's son was Vincent Yagante at that time, the most powerful head of the most powerful crime family in the city. And when the robber heard this, he was stunned. The officer said that he looked in the back and he saw him shaking his head with this question, asking, how could I be so stupid? Sin always has its consequences, does it not? When we sin, we get into more trouble than we bargained for. Sometimes it's with the law. Sometimes we sin against our families. It affects them. Sometimes our, our friends, we sin against them. It affects them. But here's what we know, that every time we sin, we break God's law, and we just can't get away with it. And when we're caught, how many times do you or I say, how could I have been so Stupid. One of the most famous portions or stories out of the book of Joshua is after the children of Israel, as you learned last week, crossed the Jordan River. Joshua leads them to a city called Jericho, which still exists in the Palestinian Authority just south of Jerusalem. And Joshua leads them to this city of Jericho, which is a walled city, and God tells them the children of Israel, that they are going to conquer that city by marching around it in a seven, eight-day period some 13 different times. And as they march around the city some 13 times, the final times blowing their trumpets and shouting, the walls of the city would collapse and the enemies within the city would be defeated. And they did do exactly what God told them to do. They obeyed God and they won the city. Next, the Israelites, as we discover in chapters 6, 7, and 8, continue to march with their military might. They come to a small town we'll call Ai. It's I or Ai. It's simply the letter A next to the letter I, a proper noun, a city, Ai. They come to this city. By comparison, a smaller town, a smaller group of people to conquer. And they attack with their adjusted smaller army due to reconnaissance that spies had done. And they fail. And they are defeated and they lose maybe three dozen soldiers in the conflict. And they are shocked by the consequence of that. This is a stunning, terrible defeat. Driven back. And General Joshua goes face down into the ground for the evening in prayer. And he stays there all night, as did the elders of Israel, and they ask the question, why? Why did this happen? Why did we have such success in the city of Joshua and have incredible victory? And why now, by comparison with a smaller city, a smaller army, why have we failed? Why could we not take Ai? And the Lord told Joshua after a while to get up and explain to him that there was, and this is a famous phrase, that there was sin in the camp, that there was sin in the community, and that this sin had to be dealt with. It was sin that needed to be confronted. And if it wasn't confronted, it would bring about even greater defeat and greater problems for the children of Israel. Israel. 
And so suddenly there was defeat in Ai on the hills of victory in Joshua. Joshua, as a general, as a leader, as a spiritual leader, had an assignment to root out the sin. So Joshua begins a a dragnet of those that are involved in conquering Joshua, or uh, Jericho. He begins to send out investigations and discoveries, and he finds out over time that there was this man named Achan who had stolen from Jericho's treasury a Babylonian robe of many colors. He had stolen silver. He had stolen gold and some other kind of shekels or currency. He went back to his tent where he dug a hole, and over the tent was a hole, or over the hole was the tent, where he hid this treasure. And I did some currency studies this week, and in today's economy, it would be maybe $30,000. And it doesn't sound like a lot, and yet it is a lot of money. It was stolen. It was a direct opposite order that God had said that all the treasury that you get from Jericho, you take it and you put it into the treasury of mine for the children of Israel for future usage. And any other thing, any other persons, any other animals, any other stuff, you destroy that, you kill that, you get rid of that, only keep the treasury, put the treasury in the treasury of God. Well, sure enough, when Achan confesses after investigation, they search Achan's tent and they find this plunder buried beneath the tent in the ground. Joshua and the leaders gather up his family, Achan himself, his livestock, everything he owns. And the Israelites stoned that family, stoned Achan, killed the livestock. All the possessions that he had were destroyed. And it's interesting in Deuteronomy 24, there's a clause that says, if a father is called in a sin, the children should not be punished. So this tells me because the children of Achan were punished, that they were in on the theft, or they were conspiring in on the theft. So there was a family problem here. Thus, we find ourselves coming to Joshua chapter 7. And it's one of the most dramatic reactions in Scripture as to the impact, the seriousness, and the consequences of sin. In fact, Achan's death, where they stone him to death, there were more stones placed on Achan's grave than the family graves to the point that it created a mound of rocks or stones there where it would be known as a place memorialized that this man died as a consequence of his disobedience to God, as a consequence of his sin. And at the root of Achan's disobedience to God, was that everything and everyone inside those walls of Jericho was to be destroyed. And all the valuables were to be put into the treasury. God made that very, very clear. But Achan disobeyed God. He sinned against God. Now, in the 21st century audience that is here, others that may be watching, we we sometimes have a hard time understanding this decree of God of stoning a family to death, but in ancient culture, it was common. In the Old Testament, it was common. Such dramatic and drastic disobedience to God demanded a dramatic and drastic measure in return. Achan and everything he had had to be destroyed. The reason why is because it is a serious thing to take on sin. In the 1646 copy of the Westminster Confession of Faith, it says this, sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of any law of God given as a rule. Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of any law of God given as a rule. In our context this morning, sin is simply failing to keep God's commandment. The penalty for sin has always been high. 
It cost Achan and his family their lives. The penalty for sin, ladies and gentlemen, continues to be high, and it cost Jesus Christ his life on the cross. In Romans 6.23, it says that the wages of sin are the paycheck of sin when it is deposited into your account is death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And what Joshua 6, 7, and 8 does, especially in Joshua chapter 7, I think it paints a very powerful picture of how sin occurs, how sin lands in our lives, how sin is fleshed out in our lives, how sin affects other people's lives. In fact, there is a snapshot of this if you look at chapter 7, verse 21. I'd like for you to see here in Achan's life a snapshot or a short progression of sin. I think it really does give you in your note-taking something to write out here as to the progression of sin, how sin works. The whole verse in chapter 7, verse 21, is after Achan says it's true of sin against the Lord in verse 20. Then he says, this is what I've done. And then verse 21 says, when I saw the plunder, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Now, just take note, if you will, in verse 21 alone, four steps in the progression of sin itself and how it's carried out in our lives as well as Achan's. Begin in verse 21 with the statement, I saw. He says there, I saw the plunder, a beautiful robe, a multicolored robe from Babylonia, I saw 200 shekels of silver. I saw a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I saw. Sin often starts with something we see. Sin often begins with something that we place our eyes on. And even after our eyes have moved on, in the aperture of our mind, our brains... Sin, when we see it with our eyes, will take a picture of that thing we see, that person we see, and provides for it the ability to come back in our imagination and in our memories. That's a powerful phrase here. He said, I saw. When the Apostle Paul is outlining and others in the Word of God as to what sin is like, the writers began to give us some phrases, some couplets and some triplets to understand what sin is like and how it, it works out in our lives. He, he talks about, to the writers there, they talk about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Going way back in ancient Joshua's world, Achan says, when I saw. The more he looked, the more he was drawn. The more I look on something that I shouldn't have, the more I am drawn to it. I looked. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, when God makes it very clear to Adam and Eve that they are not to partake of the, of the fruit of the tree, it was when Eve saw that fruit that she began to figure out a way that she would obtain it. When you see the phrase, I saw, the personal pronoun, I, I, the verb, saw, when I saw, that's the first steps toward sin being conceived in our lives. You go a little further in his narrative in verse 21, he says, when I saw the plunder, etc." he then says, I coveted. Now, the word coveted here is the Hebrew word that would be equal to the word desired or to lust 
are to want almost obsessively. It is the word covet here that is also used in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, when we are told not to covet our neighbor's wife or neighbor's husband. I saw her. I coveted her. I saw him. I coveted him. So herein we saw, I saw the lust with the lust of the eyes, and now fulfilling itself with the lust of the flesh, there is someone I want that I see. I desire, I, I lust after the things I see. I desire that. I covet it. Then there's a further progression here in verse 21. He says, I saw. Then he says, I coveted them. And then he says, if I may, I took them. So note the progression. I saw, I coveted, and now I took. And when he took those items, it wasn't an accident. When he took those items, it wasn't a, uh-oh, I didn't mean to put that in my pocket. Or I didn't mean to do that. Man, I gotta get that back. I didn't realize I had done that. No, it was, you see, it was an act of his will. So we see the lust of the eyes with I saw. We, we see the, the lust of the flesh with I coveted. And now I took, we see the will involved. We see the, the pride of life. I have, I have made a, a volitional decision that I am going to take that which is not mine. And then we look a little further. He says, I took them and then they are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So I saw, I coveted, note the progression, I took and I hid, I hid. Now this is covering up what he did. It's covering up what he stole. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned when it came to the recognition in their lives and they came to whatever reality it was in their thought processes, their spiritual life, whatever God had revealed to them, they knew that they had sinned. And when they sinned, they tried to hide. They tried to cover up. It's what happens to us when we sin. Often when we are caught, the temptation is not in my life to cover it up. The temptation in my life is to deny it. No, 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 I didn't do that. Or to blame somebody else. It wasn't me, he, he, he did that, she did that, or the devil made me do it. Or say it, our justification or rationalization in our culture today, well, what I did, I did, but it really wasn't wrong. And then let me provide for you a background and rationale why what my, I did in my sin wasn't wrong. You hear a lot of that. So what you have here in verse 21 is a, is a, it's just a, you know, this is just a little snippet here, but really what this is, it is the progression of sin. You see it, you covet it, you take it, you hide it. Now, this is a problem. It's a problem for Achan, and it is a problem for us. And this leads us to the important point of mentioning Jesus Christ forward from this point on in the message. For you see, unlike Achan, who took unlawful things, Jesus came to give unthinkable things like his life for our sins. Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he says that he who, who never sinned, he who didn't do any sin at all became sin for us. The very fact of God sending his son and his son giving his life for sin is huge breaking news for any society or any culture. But it is also an indication about the seriousness of our sin. If you go to chapter 6 for a moment and look at verse 18, there's one verse in chapter 6 of, uh, of Joshua that I wish that you would see. We get some serious cautions from God about sin. If you look at verse 18, it, God is saying this pre 
walking around the walls of the city. He's giving instructions, and he says in chapter 6, verse 18, but keep away from the devoted things, and Achan heard this, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable for what? For destruction. And you'll bring trouble on it. And goes on, he says, all the, all the silver and gold in verse 19 and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into the Lord's treasury. Let me, let me pause here as we hinge from sin and the resolution of sin found in Jesus in the cross to just remind ourselves to be cautionary about what sin does. Let me offer three very quick things in the narrative. Number one, based on verse 18, don't underestimate God and not take his commandments seriously. Achan did that. He underestimated God. He did not take God's commandments seriously. And as a result of that, his sin, think of this, it impacted a nation, it impacted an army, it impacted a family. So when we come to the word of God and God says this is right and this is wrong, this is the direction you should take in your Christian life and the direction you should not take in your Christian life, this is clearly sin. That isn't something that we underestimate. It isn't something that we should miscalculate. It isn't something that we should not take seriously. I warn you, warn me. We should not underestimate God and not take his commandments seriously because God is serious and cautionary when it comes to sin. Second thing in the narrative is this, that I get out of verse 18 and following, is our sinful actions affect more people than just ourselves. Our sinful actions affect more people than just we who commit the sin or I who commit commit the sin. Let's not fall into the lie, and it is a lie, which says, well, that's my personal sin, and my sin is too personal. It's too small to hurt anybody but me. Chuck Swindoll says, sin grieves the heart of God, does great damage to the sinner, and almost without exception affects others. Let's remember that when we sin, it has an impact on other people, not just our solo flying self. There's a third thing in this narrative that I get out of verse 18 and following, and that is the result of Achan's sin. Now, here's when you think about the verses that say, God is not mocked, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. When I think about the verse that says that God is not mocked, that your sins will find you out, don't question that, be sure of that. The result of Achan's sin is very, very clear and it's very, very powerful. When Achan sinned and it left unconfessed in his life, many Men and women died because of his sin. The armies of Israel, when they went to Ai, they melted in fear because they had just seen God do something powerful. And now they have no power upon them at all. And so they melt in fear, wondering what in the world is going on here. It all goes back to Achan's sin. Another thing that happened when Joshua fell face on the ground for a whole evening asking God what was going on, Joshua was questioning God. And when a leader gets in that kind of position where you're saying, Lord, what, what's going on here? What's happening here? How is this taking place? It, it, it's, not, it, it's the right thing to do to go to God, but, uh, but, but to be in that position where you're questioning God in just hours or days earlier, you had seen God do amazing things God, what is going on here? It's not a great place for a leader to be. And another result of Achan's sin, well, as you read this in the passage, 
that God threatened to withdraw his presence from the people. That's all the result of Achan's sin. And it's all a reminder to us of just, and listen carefully, because the culture mocks what, what we're saying. The culture builds narratives and scripts and stand-up comedy routines to mock what we're saying. There are serious cautions by God in the scripture regarding sin. So to recap, don't underestimate God and take his, not take his commandments seriously. Remember, our sinful actions affect more people than just ourselves. And the result of Achan's sin was that many people were hurt. Some died. Now, there's a tremendous lift that takes place once Achan is confronted and he confesses. And I'd like for you to look at this lift of encouragement, if you will, in chapter 8. Look at one verse or two in chapter 8 when we see that there is now a cleaning up of the mess, a dealing with of the sin, and God now recommissions the people to go back and destroy Ai. And in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, this is after the, the disciplining of Ai, and his, of Achan and his family. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai, for I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. And then verse two, he says, you shall do to Ai and his kings as you did to Jericho and its king. That means defeat. Except this time you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the city. And so Joshua and the army go out and do just that. When, what you have now is, is some liberation. It's like the, the weight has been taken off of their shoulders because sin has been confessed. And in chapter eight, verse one, you see three things that just unfold here when sin gets eliminated among God's community. Number one, there is God's encouragement. Look at the encouragement God says. He says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. That comes from God. That's the same God who, in just a few preceding verses, was saying, you need to get this thing right. Now, you get this thing right, guess what happens? You will be encouraged, and I will encourage you. The other thing that they get here, the second thing they get here is that they get God's presence in the battle. In chapter eight, verse one, he says, I've delivered already into your hands the king of Ai, his people, this city and this land. This city's gonna fall just like Jericho fell. And so there's God's presence in the battle. And I tell you, we're all in this spiritual battle every single day as Christ followers and as, as people who are involved in a community of believers like this church. And when we're engaged in this kind of thing, we are engaged in spiritual battle because the weapons of our warfare are not what the world's are. And when there is sin in our community, what happens is, the, is, 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 is we are pulled down and we, we are not as strong in battle. We don't have God's presence as we should when we're in the midst of that kind of dealing with disobedience. And then the other thing in chapter 8, verse 2, is there's God's guidance and the promise of victory. And that's so encouraging to our general to know as he takes his troops into battle, that they're going to have victory. But the only way that they got victory was because they dealt with sin. So that brings me before you today with this question, how do we deal with sin? How do we deal with sin? Well, in chapter 7, verses 13, 14, and 15, uh, there's an interesting flow of verses here where you find Joshua finding out how to have to deal with sin and that for sake of time, I'm not gonna go through the verses, but I will tell you what happened. You can look for yourselves that the way they dealt with sin is they first had to admit it. They had to identify the sinner, admit the sin, identify the sinner, and then the sin had to be punished. And a couple of times there in verses 13, 14, and 15, God's telling Joshua and the folks there to consecrate themselves. That means to, to, to repent, that means to get washed, that means to get renewed, to be made right. It's very powerful. Admit the sin, identify the sinner, punish the sin. And you say, 
Wow, that seems extreme. But my friends that I love so much in this room, that is exactly what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. He didn't punish the sinners, but he punished our sin and he became our sins. Interesting side note about Achan as I clean, clean this up and bring it to an end. Achan had time to repent. You say, really? He said, yeah, he really did. You see, every time he walked into his tent, every time he walked to his house, he knew his sin was buried beneath the tent floor. And he ignored it, or he justified it, or explained it away. Achan could have repented, but he didn't. And he was caught, and his sin resulted in death. And it's Reminder again, Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In 1787, Edward Gibbon gave the following reasons for the fall of the Roman Empire. This was written in the 18th century. The following reasons he gave for the fall of the Roman Empire. The rapid increase of divorce and loss of dignity for the family and home in Rome higher taxes and the spending of public money for feeding and entertaining the populace, the mad craze for pleasure, sports becoming more exciting and brutal every year, the building of gigantic armaments when the real enemy was their own decadence within, and the decay of religion, faith fading into mere formality without meeting the spiritual needs of the people. Is there any parallel between their world and ours today? The largest vessel afloat will never sink in the water if the water is kept without and not allowed within. No matter how important a person may be as an individual, no matter how proud we may be of our own church, the enemy is often within. We don't falter and fail because of outside weaknesses, but because of our own internal decay. And as we look at Achan and his willful violation of God's command, we see a parallel today. For instance, one of the things that the Bible is very clear about is God's holy tithe. We owe it to the Lord. For instance, the Lord's day is his holy day. Holy means that which has been set apart, that which belongs to the Lord. We are to set apart the Lord's day. For instance, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. They are not ours, they are not ours, but were bought, bought with the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross. God says we are not to violate our bodies. We cannot be strong as a church when we go against those things that God says are devoted to him. The greatest danger we as God's children have today is the enemy within, willing, willingly defying that what God's word has said. The reason the enemy is so dangerous is that we are reluctant to admit that it is there. We as a church or as individuals willingly sin against the knowledge God has given us. We rationalize doing something because it's going to make us appear accepted by the world, or it's going to make us affluent, or it is going to give us prestige. And so I would ask us, is there a secret wishfulness in our hearts to be identified with the world? Are we afraid of being ostracized by friends at work or by others in the world? We cannot be close to God and a part of the lost world at the same time. The closer we get to God, the more obedient we become to him, and the more the world will reject us. Joshua made an assumption. He assumed that everyone was as close to God as he was. We can't assume anything about anyone else. We each have our own individual covenant relationship with God, and when we violate that covenant, it affects the whole body of Christ. Just as Achan's sin caused defeat for the children of Israel, our compromising with the world causes the entire church to suffer. The church has lost its impact 
in the lost world because of Christians who have compromised. So I asked myself this week this question, and I would ask you as your pastor and someone who loves you, is there any similarity between your life and Achan's? As I said earlier, I believe Achan could have repented and could have been spared, for there were many who came to God and found forgiveness before it was too late. God has left no choice in dealing with us other than to punish us for unconfessed sin. But God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, here's the great news. Christ died for us. And the scriptures tell us that if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a message about the consequences of sin. It's deeply personal and convicting for every Christ follower in the room. And I know when we leave this place, what the world is offering and tempting, because I am tempted by it as well. I see, I covet, I desire, I want, just like you. But the Lord has called us to a higher standard. He's called us to a standard of holiness and that is not popular. He's called us to live for him, a rugged sanctification as my parents' and grandparents' generation would have called it. But that life is not being embraced as I hoped it would. Ours is the greatest cause in the history of the world. Ours is the greatest opportunity in the history of the world. My heart breaks when I watch God's people squander it And I see God's people that don't have time for God anymore. And it breaks my heart. These are the consequences of sin. But like General Joshua, he was not defeated. And he would go on. And we can go on. Being encouraged that in this culture, God has always had a people. And there is truth to be obeyed. I thank you for listening. Thank you for letting me share my heart. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, today we love you and we praise you for the life change that Jesus Christ offers. And we pray today for anyone who may be here that does not know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior, that they would remember that they are in sin, like all of us born in sin, and that they need Jesus in their lives. May today they say yes to Jesus. May they forgive, ask for forgiveness of their sins and receive Jesus into their lives. May they turn and run to you, asking you to become their Lord and Savior, and you would give them graciously the gift of eternal life. Father, I think all of us today, as we're really honest, we look back and we see where we have sinned against you and we justify sin or rationalize things. We're kind of like that criminal who realized whom he had robbed and said, how stupid can I be? And all of us just say to you, God, how stupid we are when we think we can get away with sin and cover sin. I pray, Father, that there would be a flushing of sin out of our lives an authentic confession and move of your Holy Spirit in our place and that we would roll up our sleeves and once again, if there's a coldness in our souls, determine that we would have a fresh fire for you. I beg you, God, I beseech you. I implore you, give that to us here. Give us, Father, an understanding, a sensitivity and the consequences of sin, a desire to live for you, not in a legalistic, rigid fashion, but as people who are here because of your magnificent, loving, unmeasured grace. How great you are. How wrong we have been. Forgive us, Father. Our sins are many. Now take us from this place encouraged that we can go forward with you in the culture. There are people here in the business community who have to make decisions this week. There are people in our church who have serious health problems.
And we need to call out upon you for their healing and health. There are marriages that are in trouble. Father, we have people who are struggling and in need, and I pray that we can meet those needs. We have a community in need. We have people who are hurting, who need a financial boost, who may need a job. And this magnificent economy, as we are told it is, has not touched them, and they need help. Help us to have compassion for them and help us to serve them any way we can. Take us from this place today grateful for your love, grateful for your grace, and grateful for the cross. In his name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.